Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free Microsoft 7680 Certification Training Course. This module is on performance settings. I'm James Messer. And in this module, I've broken up this last section of this particular chapter on monitoring and maintaining systems that run Windows because there's so much involved at configuring the performance settings. The ones we're going to focus in on for this particular module is configuring page files, the hard drive cache, updated drivers, configuring networking performance, power plans, and processor scheduling. In the second module we do, which is right after this one, we'll cover everything else that's listed in here. But as you can see, there are a lot of things you can do to your Windows 7 system that can improve performance, or in some cases, not improve performance. So it's important to know exactly what these different options are and where you can go to configure them. When we're using our computers, the applications that are running run in the memory inside of your computer, the random access memory, the RAM. And that's why when we buy our computers, we buy them with one gig of memory, or two gig, or four gig, or sometimes even more. Because the more memory you have, the more things that can be actively processing at one time inside of your computer. Well, of course, we always run out of that type of memory. So Windows has this thing called a page file where certain parts of the, of the applications that you're not currently using, the library files, some of the other pieces of that app, can be saved to the hard drive of your computer and essentially sit there and wait until they're needed again. And when they're needed again, they're pulled off of the hard drive and put back into memory. But in the meantime, you freed up a little bit of memory. And so these page files are very, very useful. They will temporarily store those non-executing files and so that you can configure exactly how much space you'd like to use on your hard drive to be able to do that. So of course, you have to have hard drive space available. And you would configure that in your control panel under the system system option, there is an option for advanced system settings and a performance section on that window and a settings button you can go into that brings up this configuration. So quite a few steps to get down to the virtual memory. But there are a number of different options that we can look at once we're there. Let's look at the virtual memory that's running on my computer and see what the options might be. Here's my Windows 7 desktop. We'll find those virtual memory settings in your control panel. We will go to our system configuration. I'll scroll down to system. We can go over now. You can see on the left-hand menu, we have device manager, remote settings, system protection, and advanced system settings. We'll choose that one. And under these advanced tab, you'll see there is a performance section. And there's a settings button right there, because that allows us to configure visual effects, processor scheduling, memory usage, and virtual memory, exactly what we'd like to see. And if we click on the advanced tab, we can see the virtual memory section is right here. And that's the paging file that uses an area of the hard disk that Windows uses as if it was random access memory. And my total paging file size for all drives right now, 1,024 megabytes. So essentially, I've set up a one gigabyte area on my hard drive to use as this paging memory. And if I click Change, you can see all of the different options that are available. In almost every situation, you will choose the option to automatically manage the paging file size for all drives. If there is a certain parameter that you would like to change, make sure you understand why you're doing it. Some people would like to get all of that disk space back. They may turn off paging completely, which means you're not going to swap anything out to your hard drive. Everything is going to run in memory. And there are different things that you'll need to watch out for so that you don't run out of memory when you're running applications. Other people would like to have a lot of space on their hard drive set aside. But just keep in mind that there is a point where we're just not going to have enough to swap out of your real memory to go down to the hard drive. If I only have 4 megabytes of real memory, I might have a hard drive set aside. And if I set aside 10 gigabytes of disk space, it's unlikely that I'll be swapping out enough to actually fill up that 10 gig. So that might be a waste. And that's why automatically managing the paging file size for these drives makes a lot of sense. You can see my total paging size for all drives, the minimum allowed 16 megabytes. Not a lot there, but I'm rarely going to be hitting that minimum. The recommended, interestingly enough, is about 1.5 gigabytes. Mine is currently allocated at a gig. So I only have a certain amount of room on my hard drive set aside right now. But Windows recognizes that we could make this a little bit bigger and actually get a little bit more performance in a recommended mode. But 1 gig being allocated currently is probably pretty good for the types of applications that I am using on my particular computer. If I start to get to where I'm using all of that and I can see how much is available, then maybe I do want to set it higher or lower depending on exactly how the applications are running on my particular desktop. 
the page file is always stored in the root directory of the hard drive. If we were to look at my hard drive and we go to the C colon, you'll notice that the root on my drive doesn't show anything there. That's because Windows doesn't show those by default. If I hit my Alt key, I'll get the different little menus popping up at the top. I'm going to choose Folder Options under the Tools pull-down menu, and I'm going to choose the View tab and specify that I would like to show hidden files and I would like to unhide the protected operating system files. And Windows even tells you, are you sure you want to do this? You could accidentally delete something that's pretty important. Do you want to display these files? Yes, I do. And I'll click OK. And now you can see a lot of other files pop up here. Here is this really big file sitting there hidden in the root of my C drive, this page file.sys. And that is my Windows swap file. And it's already set to a gig. So I can keep an eye on that and see exactly what's going on. Remember, you don't want to delete that file. To change that, go back to your control panel, modify the settings, and it will change the page file.sys for you. One very important aspect of Windows 7 performance is the hard drive write cache. This is a very nifty technology that allows us to put a little bit of memory right in front of our hard drives to speed up the performance of writing storage information to disk. This is important. If we didn't have that, that hard drive cache there, we would write to disk and we would have to wait for the disk to finish writing before we could do something else. And hard drives, as a storage media, they're a little bit slow. There are these platters that are spinning around. There's a drive that has to find the head in the right area on the drive. It's a, a very slow process. So having the memory in front of it really speeds things up again. And that write cache is what we're using to speed things up really nicely. If you disable the write cache on your hard drive, you will know very quickly quickly because your performance will go down quite a bit. Now USB drives, we could also cache to if we wanted to, but the default in Windows is not to write cache. And can you think of why? It's those people that are plugging in a USB drive, copying some files over, and they just pull the USB stick out. They don't go to the normal close out, shut it down process, eject it from the computer. They just pull it right out of their computer. And the people who wrote Windows for us recognize this. So they don't do any caching. When you're writing to a USB drive and you finish writing to it, it's done with its writing process. Now you can turn on caching on a USB connected drive. Just make sure you know what you're doing. Because if somebody was to pull that out, that would be a problem. Your hard drives always have hard drive write caching on it enabled. We'll look at this in just a moment. There's very few times you would ever need to disable that. One of the concerns, though, of course, is what if you lose power in the middle of writing something? Windows has thought of that. One of the things that it does is has this write cache buffer flushing option, where the cache will automatically be flushed to disk every so often, regardless of what's going on on your computer. That way, if you happen to lose power, you'll know that at least Windows tried to get everything that it could written to that disk, so nothing got got lost in the middle of that writing process. And it's very easy to change these things, enable them and disable them. Let's go to my Windows desktop. I'll show you exactly how to do that. All of the settings for your drive caching, both on hard drives and USB drives, can be done in your device manager. So I'm going to go to my Start menu in Control Panel, and I'm going to go right to the Device Manager. And here's our Device Manager. We've seen this before. I'm going to go to my Disk Drives area and expand that out to give you a view of what this looks like. I have a lot of different drives on my computer, both hard drives and I have a SanDisk USB drive on this computer. Let's start with the hard drives, though. I'm going to right mouse click and choose Properties for one of those. There is a Policies tab here, and that refers to the write caching policy. As you can see with this drive, write caching is enabled on the device, and that improves system performance to that particular drive. You can turn off write caching. You can also turn off the write cache buffer flushing on the device. And notice it warns you, to prevent data loss, do not select this unless there's a separate power supply. You're not going to lose that drive. There's not going to be a problem. It really makes sure that it's set to the defaults to get you the best performance. If somebody goes in and changes these, you're certainly going to see some changes in the performance of the computer, and in some cases, your ability to store data after you lose power. Let's look at the settings on the USB drive. I'll choose Properties for that. There is a Policies tab. Different settings for this. Notice there is a Removal policy. Quick removal is the default, which means it disables write caching. You can just pull the USB drive out. Not recommended, but if you do that, you probably aren't going to hurt too much with that. 
it's, obviously it says disconnect the device safely using the safely remove hardware notification option that's in your system tray. There is a better performance option. So if you're sure that nobody's going to come by and pull out that USB connection, maybe that's a better idea for you because maybe you're writing to that USB drive quite a bit and you'd like to get the last bit of performance out of there. There's obviously advantages and disadvantages with either one of these, but at least now you know exactly where to go to manage the performance of these USB drives. We've talked previously about making sure your drivers are updated. Some cases it's because there is a security reason to update the drivers. There may also be some performance reasons to update those drivers too. Sometimes there are some tweaks to a driver that might improve the performance of the way that driver is performing. And if it's a video driver, if it's a hard drive, driver, then you may find that you get a little bit more performance out of an updated driver from the manufacturer. There can also be, unfortunately, times when you update a driver and things get slower. You've updated a printer driver, it conflicts with something else on your computer. You update a video driver, and a program that you rely on for that video driver is no longer working properly. So new is not, not always necessarily better, and there is a built-in backup plan inside of Windows that can help protect you when this happens, and is a big button that says roll back the driver. And that can become very, very handy. Let me show you where that is. All of our driver information is in our control panel. So let's go back there in our control panel under Device Manager. That's where all of our devices are. And I'm going to look at my display adapter. I've got a VirtualBox graphics adapter. I'm going to right mouse click and choose Properties. And you can see that I have a tab just for a driver. If I wanted to see the details of the driver, I can click on it. It tells me what files are being used by this driver and the versions of the files that are there. If I have a newer version of the driver, I can even update it from here. It will go out and search automatically on the web for this or browse my computer for driver software. Maybe I've already downloaded it. I can install it from here. Also, there's that big fancy button rollback driver. That's the one that can really get you out of a pickle. If you've installed a new driver and it isn't working quite right, simply click rollback driver and it says, are you sure you would like to roll back to the previously installed driver software? And it tells you this may not be a good idea, but if you know what you're doing, go ahead and click yes and continue on. If you've never installed another driver, you don't even get the option. For instance, if I look at, let's look at my sound driver. You'll see that if I click the driver tab, I don't even have the choice to roll back to a previous driver. So you really can't go wrong. As long as your previous driver really was working OK, rolling back to that previous driver should work just fine. And you can do that just by clicking the roll back driver button. The process of using your browser and using the network can also be optimized. If we go into our control panel under Internet Options, there's an Advanced tab where we can manage exactly the experience that people are going to have when they're using their browser and using other resources on the network. One is this Accessibility option. If you have somebody who would like to have some additional options to be able to look at images differently, to change text sizes for new windows and tabs, a great place to go to modify the experience that people are going to have when they're using resources on the network. There's also a series of browsing functions that you can enable and disable, some that will show you script messages, some that will get rid of the script messages, depending on what you'd like to do. Some nice options there as well. There's some multimedia options. This one can be really useful for improving performance because maybe you have a very slow link and you don't want every movie to be automatically downloaded and every image to be automatically downloaded over that link. Just by disabling those few settings inside of these options, you can really improve the performance of what you see on the screen. And lastly, there are security sections where we can go through and modify exactly the options available to you for security. Sometimes turning some of these things on will prevent data from being written to your computer. But you might also get error messages associated with that. So you do want to know exactly what you're doing when you're looking at that security section. Let's look at a few of these and see what options might be available. That again is in my control panel. Let's go there. In this case, we're going to go to our internet options. And you can see you have an Advanced tab right on the right side where you have Accessibility, those browsing options. You have the multimedia options here to play animations and sounds and web pages, show pictures. You might want to turn those off if you've got bandwidth issues. And down here at the bottom are options for security. There's quite a few. You can have things like allow active content from CDs to run on my computer. That may or may not be what you'd like to do. From a performance perspective, you have ideas of 
empty temporary internet files folder when the browser is closed. Just that one setting might free up a lot of disk space every time you close the browser. Here's another one. Do not save encrypted pages to disk. Another opportunity to save some disk space that you might need for later. There are some other pieces in here, one that really would affect how your experience is when using different websites. You can enable integrated Windows authentication. So especially if you're using a lot of internal websites that need to log in, you can have your Windows automatically do some of that behind the scenes using some interesting protocols. What's nice about that is if you have that checked, you're never prompted over and over and over for the same username and password. So a lot of different performance tweaks you can do in here that may have to do with bandwidth, saving disk space, or just the overall experience for the end user. We've used the Task Manager before so that you're able to see exactly the processes running on your computer. But you also have a lot of control over the way those processes are running. Go right to your Task Manager in your Processes tab, and you have the ability to set exactly the priority that that application is going to run on. So if you have something that maybe is during, doing a lot of processing in the background, maybe you are rendering a video, but you'd still like to have more access to do things in the foreground, you could take that video performance and the video process and turn it down to maybe a below normal priority and leave your normal desktop at a normal priority. And you'll see your performance might increase because we've slowed down exactly the way that that particular rendering process is going to use the availability of our CPUs. You can also set something called affinity. You can assign particular processes to particular CPUs of your computer, assuming you have a technology in your computer that allows you to split things between CPUs. It's a nice capability, and it certainly would allow you to put some processes on one processor, another set of processes on another processor, and then set priorities across all of those. Normally, you don't have to set any of these things. Windows handles it all automatically. But it's nice to know that you can go right in there to the Task Manager and really configure it exactly the way you'd like it. Here's my Windows desktop. I've got quite a few things going here. There's Minesweeper. I've got Paint. There is a video I'd like to play. There's Calculator running. If I right mouse click in my taskbar at the bottom and choose Task Manager, my Processes tab shows me exactly what's going on for these processes. And if I have a, a Microsoft's a Media Player right here, I could change the priority of this Media Player to be real time or to be low or anything in between. I could also set the affinity because this particular machine that I have has two CPUs. And I could choose maybe I just want that to run on CPU 1 and everything else I might want to run on CPU 0 so that when I play the video, that continues to run. And it doesn't affect anything that I do with my Minesweeper over here. Let's see if I can crash this Minesweeper real good. Boom, lost. But it, nothing's going on over here that would affect the performance of my Minesweeper or of my video that's playing. So I have a couple of different options on what I can do. You've got a lot of control. And especially if you're doing things with streaming media or things that use a lot of CPU cycles, you may want to customize exactly how Windows uses those right there in the Task Manager. It's quite a few topics in performance just for this section one. Let's see what we've learned so far. Our first question, is write caching enabled for USB drives? There's one type of drive that it is enabled. Another type of drive it isn't enabled. And for USB drives, it is not enabled. And that's because people so often just pull that USB disk right out of your computer. And we don't want to have write caching set up for something like that. The next question, what is the assignment of a process to a specific CPU called? If you recall, we even set that for our video player that we were just using. That's called Affinity. And the last question, where can you find the page file configuration? If you recall, we had to go pretty deep to locate it inside of our Control Panel. It's in Control Panel. Under the System option, there's an Advanced Security Settings that brings up a Performance set section, and then finally a Settings button that you can go into to change exactly where those configuration settings are for your virtual memory. That covers our requirements for this performance setting, this first section anyway, where we've gone through page files, hard drive caches, updated drivers, networking performance, and processor scheduling. And of course, part two is next. We're going to go through all of these other performance items as well. If you'd like to watch any of our absolutely free Microsoft videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards, or send me a message, you can visit our website at ProfessorMesser.com.